You know, in the newspapers every day, or for that matter in the scientific journals, every day there are new studies that come out. And they have often provocative titles and interesting abstracts that suggest something really important has happened. And oftentimes it is really important, uh, but oftentimes it's a finer conclusion that may not ultimately be repeated. And at the end of the day, really good science, things that we can use to help us care for patients by better diagnosis or better treatment or better prevention, really depend on replication. It means that you can find the same thing again and again. And one of the reasons that we don't see studies being replicated after they appeared in a major journal and usually the New York Times or someplace else like that, CNN or whatever, is that the methods that are used to do the study are problematic. Now, it's not because people want to do a bad job. It's extremely difficult to do a study with very good methods. And it's very expensive to do it. Now, what do I mean by very good methods? It means that you have to very carefully collect your sample, and the sample has to be large enough and of sufficient quality that you can actually do the proper, proper analyses so that you can arrive at conclusions. And what do I mean by that you have to collect your sample in a proper way? What you need to know, so for example, that you have the right number of boys and girls that represent this particular disorder in this population, that there are other characteristics about the population that allow you to generalize from it and that you measure the things of interest in a way that you can be confident that you're measuring the right things. All too many studies today have sample sizes that are way too small. And so making statistical inference from those may be possible, but may not be useful in terms of being clinically meaningful. So statistically significant doesn't always mean clinically meaningful. And being able to take studies the right way and use them is a problem. So for example, there, one of the areas that's very troubling is understanding environmental influences on a whole variety of medical conditions. Autism is certainly being one of them, but a whole variety of others. If you don't take a sample that's large enough that appropriately represents the population in question, you're not going to be able to do the analyses that are necessary. And I'll give you an example. There are a whole variety of studies about autism, its prevalence, that is how many people actually have it, the effects of environment on it, that are derived from what we call administrative data. People who've signed up for a program, or people who are in special education, or people who get a particular set of services. Those kinds of data are oftentimes very biased. Why are they biased? Well, first of all, they only include people who got in. And there are lots of reasons why people don't get into a data set. You don't have the right insurance. You're not, you don't know how to get connected. You don't have a car to go to the agency to sign up. Um, there are a whole variety of things that can interfere. You're not a US citizen. I mean, there are a whole variety of things that can interfere with your ability to be in that data set. In addition, the data set may have criteria that eliminate certain kinds of people. So some data, some service systems won't take people with IQs under 70. Some people won't take uh, people with, uh, who have uh, otherwise healthy functioning. Some data systems won't take people who have other medical conditions. And just because you have autism doesn't mean you don't have any asthma or diabetes or something. So there, you have to understand that where the, the sample is drawn from. And if the sample is drawn from a population that's already skewed, then you can have information that's already skewed. And when we're trying to understand environmental factors, we have to have a sample of people who readily reflect the community in question. Then we have to know at an individual level whether they were exposed to the environmental issue in question. To know that all people in one area lived in a rainy season or not a rainy season isn't helpful to us. We have to know who was there, when they were there, how much they were exposed to it as at an individual level. At a group level, it doesn't tell us anything about the cause of disorder. And so what happens is we end up with skewed data sets with poorly selected measurement, and then people come up with a finding. 
And try, I'm sure they're being honest and they're trying to give us the best they can, but the best they can is often misleading and makes people very anxious. And the classic story of this is the vaccine story in autism. If there ever was a classical story of a terrible mistake, it was originally drawn from a small sample of children in a gastroenterology clinic. The people who proffered this problem didn't go out and examine it in the larger community and look at what vaccines do. And, and, and as a result, they misled us, in addition to having their own biases and conflicts of interest, which they failed to disclose. And as a result, many people stopped vaccinating their children, and some children died from infections because they weren't protected from the vaccine, when in fact, now all the data seem pretty clear that the vaccines are protective, of even for autism. So, you know, I think it, we have to be very cautious. Well-intended people, good scientists, parents, everybody can still make mistakes. And our job as scientists, as parents, I'm a parent, as a practitioner, but as people in the media and so on, really need to be just as critical of a good piece of news as they are accepting of it. So we understand its limits and we don't go whole hog into adopting it until it's replicated and people have had a chance to carefully examine what those data mean and how they can be applied to individual patients in communities here and around the world.